All right, y'all turn to Romans 8, verse 26. I want to um, spend one more night, Lord willing, with, with this little section of passage to cover a few more things. Um, we talked about, we'll do a little review on it and stuff, but um, before we get going, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, but let me go ahead and tell y'all that um, Art is out of the hospital. Um, y'all know doctors, I guess they scare you sometimes, but they had said his kidneys, you know, and so he, you know, that's, anyway, turns out he was uh, really dehydrated. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it looks like Greg. Um, he was really dehydrated, and so he's doing better. Um, he didn't come to class last night, just worn out from the whole thing. But anyway, he's down there preaching the gospel and code in tonight. So I thank the Lord for that. And um, he said, thank everybody for their prayers, okay? All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for the privilege of allowing us to meet in freedom to study your word. Father, forgive us for not taking this uh, more importantly, for not looking at it in the, in the way that we ought to as the most important thing in the entire world. Help us with our indifference and our lukewarmness, Father, but we know that in your love you will not turn us away, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy that secures our salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> In Romans 8, we've been dealing with 26 and 27. Okay? Let's go ahead and read them. <clears throat> Remember, Paul started out here. He says, hey, Greg. Yes. How you doing? Hey. Hey, guys. How y'all doing? I figured y'all be hitched by now. <laughs> okay. We're in Romans 8, 26. Paul says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And y'all know I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all we covered some of this. And really what it's saying is there's a couple little things there that we can kind of clear up from the Old English. He said, Likewise another work of the Spirit is that He helps us in our prayer life. Doesn't he? Remember chapter 8 is all about the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says, likewise the, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. It's really singular. Our weakness. And we talk about what our weakness is. Our weakness is what he's just got done saying. Just before this he said that we're saved, but yet we're saved in hope, still waiting for the adoption. In other words, we're saved, but we're still in the weakness in our flesh. And in this condition, even though we're saved, we still have this weakness, don't we? Our big weakness really is this. We can't see the spiritual realm. We don't really understand God's will, and we don't fully understand what he's doing. Now we know what he's revealed to us. Um, some of it. We don't know all of it. But what the thing is, in this current state, do you and I, are we able to see tomorrow and see how God's operating? No. And so in that condition, it leaves us in a state where sometimes we get in a position where we don't know what to pray for. Now, it doesn't mean every time, and we're going to talk about this, but there are certain times when me and you just get in a position where we really don't know what it is we're supposed to pray for about a thing. And when you get in that, he said the Holy Spirit comes along and helps. Helps us. So it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth with our infirmity. For we know not the what, it says, we should pray for. In other words, the specific thing in the situation to pray for, as we ought. In other words, we don't know what's proper to ask. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll find even the, the great saints in the Bible asking for something that really they shouldn't have been asking for. Remember Paul trying to get his thorn in the flesh removed? Mm -hmm. And three times he prayed, and the Lord said, No, my grace is sufficient for thee. So that's just proof that no matter how advanced you are in the Christian life, prayer is an area where me and you have a lot of weakness. Now he says, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And again, this is not, we talked about it some, this is not saying that the Spirit has a special prayer language. Y'all know people are quick to jump on something like that. Can you really fathom any way that the Holy Spirit would communicate to God and not be able to say, just groan? No. This is the Holy Spirit of God. He knoweth all things. Okay? He knows the Father's will. What he's saying is, there are times when me and you don't know what to say. We don't know what to ask for and we're in such turmoil that all we can really do is just kind of groan. Now that don't mean that this is the highest form of prayer. People say that. That this is the highest. No, it's not. There are people that say you're not really praying unless you're doing this. You better read the Bible. The Bible's full of prayers that are words, aren't they? Remember in Hosea, the Lord told the Israelites to come to him in repentance, and he said, bring with you words. 
In other words, don't come. You come and you, you know, in other words, you openly confess with words. You come and you state what you've done. And we're told over and over how we've got great prayers in the Bible that are words. This is not also saying that the prayer is something that the groaning is so special that it can't be described. Now I say that because there's a similar word that's used. For instance, um, when Paul got, got, had a vision of the third heaven, y'all remember what he said about it? He said he couldn't put it into words, could he? In other words, how are you going to describe that? We're not told a whole lot about heaven, the description of it, because to be honest with you, words fail. What, what English words are you getting? What Greek words? What words could you use, period, to describe the glory of God? But he said it was indescribable, right? That's not what this is saying. What it's saying is it's groanings that are not contained in words. We could say it this way, wordless groanings. Look, I have found there, have, there, there are times when I just, there's turmoil, there's something going on, and you, you just get on your knees and you're trying to pray to God, and you are just in such turmoil that all you can really, all I can say is just, just mercy, Lord. Just, oh, Lord, mercy. Now, mercy is a word, but don't y'all know that, oh, Lord, that groaning? How many times do we read in the Old Testament when the psalmist or Isaiah starts with, oh, we tend to just read, oh, Lord, you need to focus on that, oh. It's, oh, right? And what he's saying is there are times when a Christian is in this position, and when we're in that position, what promise do we have? The Holy Spirit's going to come right along and help us. Now, he says it in the next verse. And he that searcheth the hearts, God, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. You see, God knows our heart. And if God knows our heart, then God knows what we're going to ask. God knows what we need, so the groaning's going to get there anyway, isn't it? So what he's basically telling us is that the Spirit, uh, God, the Spirit knows God, God knows the Spirit, because the Spirit maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now we're going to come back and cover this thing and dig, uh, dig at it some, but the first thing we need to do is deal with the terms. Because there's some words here that if we, if we look a little deeper, it'll really help us. Okay, let's start with helpeth. When it says the Spirit helpeth, notice that's ongoing present tense. This is a, a, the Greek word's about that long. It's three words. It's a compound word. And here's the words. It means together. You know, like a symphony. When you see S Y, that that's that's the first sim. Okay, it's together, it's over against or alongside, and it's take up. So what the word means is this: it means to come alongside someone and take up part of their load that they're struggling with. This is the picture of the word. The Greek word is somebody's walking along and they've got a load and they can't bear it. They're about to drop it and a friend comes alongside, sees them in trouble and picks it up and helps them with the load. And that's what it's saying the Holy Spirit does for us in prayer. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? I mean, that gives me a lot of comfort to know that. So it, it's that word. It's the same word. I'll show you all to it one time. Go to uh, Luke 10. And it's not, make sure we cover this, it's not saying that me and you don't need to do anything, the Holy Spirit's going to do it. It says He comes alongside and helps. Helpeth. What does helpeth mean? Assist. It means assist you. You still do your part, right? Now here's the idea. In, in Luke 10, 38, Now it came to pass as they went into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received Him into her house. Jesus and the apostles come into the house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. He, I love Mary. This is not Mary the mother of Jesus. This is, this is a, a not very often mentioned Mary, Martha's sister. Mary no, not me. It's, it's another Mary, yep. Yeah. It's Lazarus' two sisters. Mm -hmm. Every time this Mary is mentioned, do you know what she's doing? Jesus. She's at the feet of Jesus. Guess who's the only person you can find in the Bible that believed Jesus was going to die before the cross? Man. Her. Remember she come in and anointed his feet and he said, she's done this for my death. Where y'all reckon she got that where the others missed it? 
because she had her mouth closed and her ears open at his feet, right? So she's doing that. She's doing what's important. Don't you think hors d'oeuvres and coffee could wait? But Martha's got the opposite personality. And look, nobody's saying one's saved and one's... No. Martha is, is more of a doer. Y'all know some people fret over that sort of stuff. And hey, if that's your personality, that's your personality. But Martha comes and says in verse 40, Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, does thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Y'all see help? Yes. It's the same word. Now, is she saying, I want to sit down and Mary needs to do all the work? No. She said, I've got a load on me that's too much to bear. I need her to come alongside and pick up some of the weight. That's the whole idea of the prayer. Okay, it's that. <clears throat> all right. It's two pull easier than one, don't they? Hey, Y'all remember I put it in the note. We'll, we'll flip there. Just go to Matthew uh, 10. You know, if we don't get through this tonight, we just won't get through it. We'll take our time. I, I, I have a bad habit of trying to keep things in blocks, and that's not a good thing to do. All right. In Matthew 11, we've got this famous passage. 10 or 11? 11. If I'd said 10, I'm sorry. Matthew 11. <clears throat> Verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Mm -hmm. Now, if a person is laboring and heavy laden, how do we say that today? They're carrying a load, right? They've got a load on them. What do you think would be the load that these Jewish people would have on them at this time? Trying to keep the law, wouldn't it? It'd be the same load you've got on you in any religious system that's teaching works for salvation. I grew up with the Catholic load on my shoulders. I couldn't carry it. He says, Come unto me, all you that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, when he says, I'll give you rest, he's not saying that I'm going to take it and you're going to quit laboring and it's going to be done. Now, that idea goes out the window. He says, I'm going to give you labor or rest from that load. Right? But then he says this, Take my yoke upon you. Now what is a yoke? It's two hoops that you hook two oxen together. You know why you use a yoke? Because two plow better than one. So he's saying, lay down this load that you're carrying. And he doesn't say go loadless. He says, take up my load, my load right? But he says, my load's going to be a lot easier. Why? Because I'm going to pull alongside of you. So he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. There are two rests in this passage. Rest from the law. Now that doesn't mean lawlessness. It means rest from being under the conviction of trying to keep the law to go to heaven. Trying to work your way into heaven. Rest from that. And then what does he promise? Rest with Him. So he says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now when he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he doesn't mean you don't have anything to do. He means I'm going to take that, that burden that used to weigh you down and crush you, and now I'm going to give you something that you're going to be thrilled to carry. You know, it, when it comes to work, and it, it really is all in the attitude, really, if you think about it. He, I've told you all this story before, but I always think of it in this situation. When I was, when I, I was, I guess about the time I turned about 13, maybe 12, somewhere in there, um, my mom and dad got divorced, and I went to work with a, a family member on a Christmas tree farm. And they had these Christmas trees planted, and he had them planted in these long rows. I mean, thousands of Christmas trees in long rows, right? And I had to trim them and do all this stuff to them. And when I had to trim them trees, y'all know how fast a pine tree grows. It gets them green shoots. So in the summer, about every four weeks, I had to trim them. And I can remember walking out in the morning. It's hot. The, the gnats are already starting. You know how they are in the morning. And I'd go to that first tree and I'd start to trim and I'd look down that row like that, far as I could see. And you know how that'd make you feel? That'd be the worst day because your mindset is it's a load, right? Now, if that had been my Christmas tree farm and I was going to make the money, I'd have probably been smiling and trimming them, you know? But it's, it's that. It's the same thing that the Lord told us about the law. Under the old covenant, the Jew thought the idea was we tote the law, we are God's people, and they couldn't do it. Under the new covenant, he said, I'll write the law in your heart. I'll cause you to want to keep it. 
Now, doesn't that make a lot of sense? He, uh, me and Gina laugh about, you know, how kids are. You ever notice, Gina said when she was little, she refused to do housework and just, she was the biggest slob you've ever met, right? But she said she'd go to the neighbor's house and clean their toilets, whatever they wanted, just happily. Why? Because she wanted to. You know, when you want to do something. And so this is, is what the word means. It means that the load that you're trying to carry is going to become far less of a burden because you got someone helping you. Y'all know misery likes company. What I wouldn't have done to have somebody trimming trees with me there to talk to and whatnot. No, I didn't have that. And when I did have it, I wished I didn't have the one I had. That was the worst part. <clears throat> but, um, okay, so that's the word helpeth, right? Now, maketh intercession. Back over to Romans 8. He says, the Spirit maketh intercession. This is another important word. This is to come to the rescue of. So the first word means to come alongside and pick up the load. This one means to come to the rescue of. It's really, it's kind of like a legal term. Okay, but it means to come to the rescue of, to plead the case of. This making intercession is the help. How does the Spirit help us? He maketh intercession. He pleads our case. With God. With God. And this is, I mean, it's a perfect, it's, I mean, it really is just a perfect system if you think about it. All right, y'all think about making intercession. For instance, a lawyer, okay? What's the first thing that the lawyer does when you take his, he takes your case? He starts, you tell him. what's facts. Yeah, he gets the facts. And then he begins to instruct you on forget that, don't say that, forget this, you need to mention this. He begins to train you what to say, doesn't he? A good lawyer, look, lawyers today I have found wait to the last day, and that morning they want to call you and figure out what case they got. They want to take all the cases they can and steal your money. But a good lawyer prepares you, right? But at the same time, the lawyer is working with you on how to answer the judge's questions, he's also talking to the judge for you, isn't he? Now we've got two intercessors in Romans 8. The Spirit dwelling in us intercesses with us. He, he causes us when we don't know what to pray for. Not only does He prompt us to pray, but when we're in a jam, He comes alongside and He gives us utterings. In other words, groanings that can't be understood. You know, just wordless groanings. And yet, He knows what it is. And Jesus Christ is interceding with the Father. So you've got an advocate in two people, don't you? It's just like going to court with Perry Mason. Perry Mason makes sure you know the answers and he's going to ask the questions that are right. And this is what we've got the promise from God. So how are you going to go wrong with prayer? I tell you the only place you can really go wrong with prayer is to barge into God's throne room arrogantly. To think, you know, not stop and think about the privilege. Yeah. Or what do we tend to do? We tend to barge in with our needs, don't we? Yes, I want. I want. What is all prayer? What, how should it start? In the, name of Jesus. In, the, in the name of Jesus means I can only come to you because of what my Savior's done. He died on that cross to make it possible for a sinner like me to come in your presence. Were it not for the sacrifice of Christ, if I entered your presence, I'd burn up. You're too holy. And so we come to Him knowing, Father, in Jesus Christ's name and by the Spirit you've given me, I come to you and thank you. Grateful. Almighty God, creator of everything, praise and, and worship, His will. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Yes. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It was all about Him first. Down towards the end of the prayer, He says, By the way, give us this day our daily bread. And that's how we, we put God first. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, groanings. Again, groanings comes from a word that means to be in a straight, to be in a tight spot. You ever been put on the spot and you don't know what to say? He, I, I have an affliction. I mean, I, I don't even know how I wound up this way. I don't think I was this way when I was little, but when you put me on the spot to make small talk, I can't come up with anything. I can't even think, how's the weather been? You know, they always seem to talk about the weather. I just can't do it. Now, people would think you were crazy that no such affliction exists, but I met a woman that's got the same thing and married her. 
we both got it. <laughs> Lexi knows what I mean. It, your palms sweat, you, know, you just don't know. And if I know you good, I can talk with you. But if, you're, if I don't know you very well, it, it's, it's hard for me. You just, let's see, Tony, let's, you know, see, I can't do that. <laughs> Mark can. Mark can just say, Gina, handle it, talk. <laughs> but what it's really talking about here is it's talking about to be in a, in a tight spot and not be able to utter the right word. Hey, me and Lexi have been watching Cheers. I've been telling y'all an old Cliff Clavin. You remember the mailman? Yeah. Every time a woman wants to talk to Cliff, he makes this. <laughs> That's all he can say. Well, sometimes in our prayer life, again, we get under uh, certain situations and turmoil and things, and that's kind of how we are. And yet, even in that condition, what can we be sure of? God knows your heart. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit's going to prompt you. Read our mind. Yeah, He does. And so, what God really wants is not for me and you to just say, well, God knows the heart. I don't need to pray. No, God wants us to come to Him and groan. Mm -hmm. Just come to Him and groan. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, we talked about the cannot be uttered. Again, that means without words, not expressed in speech, okay? It doesn't mean that it's not possible to put into words. It means at that moment you don't use words, okay? So that's what he's talking about, <clears throat> wordless groans. Now, another thing to add here I want to point out is notice it says, um, uh, verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Who's us? The saints. The saints. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. This, the world hates what I'm about to tell y'all, but the lost man cannot get his prayers into the throne room of God. The lost person has no way. You know, it's a, we have turned prayer into something that's ridiculous in our country today. They want to call National Day of Prayer. God ain't hearing most of that. How about they want to, this is what we hear all the time, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I hear politicians who are just live like the worst atheists and then they say, thoughts and prayers are with you. Prayers to who? No one else yeah. me. Yeah, it's serious. I mean, it's just, it's absolute. What it does is it tends to get people to believe the doctrine of universalism, that God's the father of all. No, he's not. God said, you remember the man in John 9, what he said, the blind man? The blind man got healed, and he was just some dumb old, you know, poor Jewish fella. He was born blind. Jesus healed him, and the Pharisees got on him. Yep, that's him. And the Pharisees got on him and said, he did this on the Sabbath day. He's a sinner. And the man said, sinner? He said, well, how can you say that? And he said, he did this. So he said, well, I know one thing. The man obviously has got the power of God, and we all know God heareth not sinners. That's right. And that's the truth. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't hear us if we still have any sin. In our, it means when you are in your lost condition, you do not have an intercessor. Therefore, how can you get to God? You can't. What did they have to do to get into the presence of God in the Old Testament? Only the high priest could go. And what did he have to take with him? Blood. Uh, yes. What about the common Jew? They were dependent on that high priest. As close as they could get to the presence of the glory of God was being represented in a little stone in his breastplate, wasn't it? Yeah. But what's Jesus Christ made it possible for me and you to do? We, can go, we go right to the throne room. You, look, if you're saved, you get closer to God Almighty than that high priest Aaron ever did. We can go behind the veil. You go, the veil was ripped. Okay, we go straight to him. You got it. So, when it says for the saints, uh, another one that, just to back this up, y'all go to John 17. Again, remember Romans chapter 8 is telling us all the things that we have because we are in Christ. Now, when you are in Adam, what do you have? You got all Adam's attributes and nothing else, right? The minute Adam sinned, what happened to him? Out of the garden. Look, this is a picture for me and you. It's showing us the holiness and the righteousness of God. What did God do when he put them out of the garden? Now, God saved them. There's no doubt Adam and Eve were saved. God God's showed them with a sacrifice, and Jesus Christ paid for their sins. But when God put them out, y'all remember what he did? He put a cherubim at the garden, didn't he? What does that cherubim have in his hand? A flaming sword. What does that speak of? 
The holiness of God and now a sinner. Can he approach God? No way. And so this is all the way through the Scripture. Matter of fact, Greg brought up the veil in the temple. Y'all remember what was embroidered in the veil? Cherubim. What were they doing there? <laughs> it's a symbol of showing you that veil separation from God. It's the holiness of God. Okay. <clears throat> now, in uh, John 17... Jesus is praying, and He says, uh, He's praying for the, the men that God gave Him. And He says in verse 9, I pray for them, those that God gave Him. I pray not for the world, but for them which Thou hast given Me, for they are Thine. Does Jesus intercede for the lost world? <laughs> when someone is lost and people tell them, well, you just need to pray to God, you're telling them to do something that they can't do. They can pray all day long. It'll never get there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Right? So it doesn't just mean that we can't get to heaven except through Christ. It means we have no access to the Father except through the Son. And right now today in prayer, that's our access through Christ. That's why we're told to pray in the name of Christ. That's not a magic formula like hocus pocus. You say, in Jesus' name, and He's going to hear you. It means that you acknowledge in your mind and your prayer, my Savior ripped that veil by His death. He made this possible. Lord, I'm coming to you through Him. Hey, this is what we do. <clears throat> All right, now, according to the will of God, this is the last thing He says. Now, this does not mean, I keep doing these negatives, but this doesn't mean that the prayers that the Holy Spirit answers, or, or the prayers that the Holy Spirit prompts us to pray are going to be answered because He'll only prompt us according to the will of God. That's true, but that's not the context. In the context, it's saying we come to God not knowing what to pray for, and one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is He comes alongside and takes up the load with us. Stutney. And who is it that sends him? God. It's that the Holy Spirit does this according to the will of God. How has God so deemed that he was going to operate in the world? Before the foundation of the world, God the Father had a plan. God the Son is going to carry it out, and the Holy Spirit is going to be the administrator on earth with it, right? And how did God determine that He was going to let people interact with His plan? Through prayer. You know, when you sometimes we get in trouble about prayer because we'll say, well, hold on. God knows what I need before I ask. The Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. Why pray? Well, we, how do you answer that? It, it is an act of faith for sure. But the first thing you always can answer is, if you've got a command from God, that's where you start, right? You say, well, why should we pray? Because God told us to. That's always the first place to start, isn't it? But the next place to start is, God has ordained the end. Has He not? Has God got the plan all set up? But doesn't God also ordain the means to get to the end? Well, what's one of the means that God has ordained to use? Prayer. It's prayer. Hey, Y'all know, I think about, hey, it's not so much with a girl, but with a boy you start to see it more. Sienna's is always, I mean, she's a girl. She doesn't care much about a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. Something about a little boy. I mean, I don't know what it is, but if you go to do something, every time I turn around, I'm knocking Gabriel over. He's right under my feet. Now, you know, as a father, it, you, <clears throat> there are certain times that you're doing something, and what is that? All that kid wants to do is what? Mr. To help. Yeah. And what you do is he's really not helping you. But you like that he wants to help you because you want that relationship. So you allow him to take part in what you're doing when actually what he's doing is really just kind of slowing the process down. But God has so ordained that he allows us to participate in his will through prayer. You know, God knows who He's going to save, but the Holy Spirit prompts us to pray for the salvation of people, doesn't He? I've found that when somebody really comes on my heart a lot and I'm prompted to pray for them, something's about to happen. You say, well, why? Because the Holy Spirit is prompting you according to God's will. So we've got this promise. I mean, really, how can we go wrong? We can't. 
All we can do is grow lazy in prayer. We can grow disobedient and get chastised, or we can just absolutely ignore it. And if we ignore it, we'll look out. <laughs> but the whole idea of this, uh, this section here is the assurances of the work of the Spirit. And y'all think of all the things he's told us that the Spirit does. It gives us assurance of our salvation. He, you know, one of the things I, I saw years ago was certain people get into false doctrine and they just stay there. They just get into really bad, harmful doctrine and they just serve out there and die. Some people get into bad doctrine and yet even that doctrine cannot suppress their desire to see people saved. Hey, those people that just get into the doctrine and stay there, they act like they want to hear people say, but what they really want is the notoriety of being the one that was preaching when they were saved. I'm going to give you an example. Like me and Lee come out of bad doctrine, just point blank. But all of a sudden, God began to open our eyes, and it was me and Lee and other people. It's like all together, this little group separately started seeing things in the Scripture, and we began to kind of come out of it. But Lee used to tell me about a man that was involved in that same doctrine, and the sincerity of that man and his salvation was shown because Lee said, I'll never forget his name was Har, wasn't it, Lee? Brother Har. Brother Har. I never you met him. Man? No. But I remember the story because it stuck with me. Lee said that old man got up every day and went to Bel Air Mall and sat on a bench and stopped everybody that come by to talk to him about Jesus Christ dying for their sins. He had horrible doctrine, but he had the gospel, didn't he? Now, you might meet people that have perfect doctrine and know the gospel, but where's their heart for lost people? You see, what happens is you can rest assured that man was saved because that man was showing forth the fruit of the Spirit. And what are the assurances of our salvation in a visible manner? It's the fruits of the Spirit, isn't it? And this is more of it, more of the work of the Spirit in the life of a lost person. I mean, a saved person, not in the life of a lost person, right? <clears throat> all right, so let's get to the doctrine of what all this is. When he says the Holy Spirit uh, intercedes with these groanings, these wordless groans, who is it that groans? It's either the Holy Spirit or it's us, right? Now, if you're in the holiness movement, what are they going to tell you? It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit groaning and in a special prayer language. Y'all have heard that one, haven't you? Um. Hmm? I've had a, a teacher, uh, she's dead now, and I, I wouldn't say her name anyway, but I had someone that taught me, and years later I, I got a chance to talk to her about the Lord several times, and she told me that the Holy Spirit, God, through the Holy Spirit, had given her a special prayer language, right? And I said, why would you need that? Does God not understand English? She said, no, but he gave me these special 12 syllables of a prayer language. Now, y'all know why she chose 12. Everybody can see that's a special number in the Bible. But when she told me that, special syllables, why would God need such a thing? Folks, God knows our heart. Why would he need any of this? When God ever got involved in language at all, for instance, on Pentecost, he didn't do it for God's sake. He did it for the people's sake so they could understand, didn't he? But I said, 12 syllables, really? Now, what did that do? It made her feel special. I didn't have it. But I asked her, I said, can I hear them? And she said, well, sure. And she started making these noises. She started, I remember the first one was, eh. And she would eh, kah, come making these noises, but y'all know why she was doing it subconsciously, what she was doing? On her finger, she was doing this down here, counting them. And I'm watching her. Why y'all reckon she was counting them? She had to make 12 sounds. When she got done, I said, wow, would you do that again? She wouldn't. Y'all know why. I mean, and look, I'm not picking on her, okay? This poor woman had somebody tell her something that made her feel good and closer to God. And she literally told me right there at that moment, she said, you're not taking this from me. I wasn't trying to take that from her. I was trying to get her to see she didn't need a special prayer language to get to God. You don't need anything to get to God but the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. And how do you get the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ? By faith, by believing on the finished work of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you believe on Him, you've got it, okay? 
So, it's us that groans. It's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit causes us to groan. And it doesn't mean that we don't know how to groan. It means sometimes I don't even know what to pray for and I just feel like I can't pray. But something brings me to my knees. And something causes me to keep going to God and I don't know what to say. It's the Holy Spirit keeps bringing me there till I get to a point that I can't do anything but say, Lord, help. That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, again, let's see. Um, it's not a prayer language. We talked about that. Uh, Jesus taught the disciples to pray, and He didn't teach them prayer syllables. He taught them language, didn't He? Um, Hosea said, again, bring words with you. Um, let me give you the idea behind this. Go back over to Romans 8. I tell you what, let's do it backwards. Go to Galatians, if you would, first. Okay, Galatians 4. We covered this no, a few months ago, but let's, let's look at it quickly again. All right. <clears throat> it says in, um, oh, verse uh, 6, 4, 6, And because you are sons... Now look, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, you're a son of God, right? Son means heir. It's always just put as sons. But he says, because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Right? Now, does the Spirit... That's Daddy. It's Daddy. That's what it means. It's a, it's a term of, of no. It's not Father. It's, it's Dad. It's right? Abba Father. But when it says this, in this particular verse, I can't tell reading this in the language whether it's the Holy Spirit saying Abba Father or who. You really can't tell, can you? Hey, did I give y'all a bad reference? Y'all got it? No. Okay. okay. All right, so he says, Because you're sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, is it the Holy Spirit crying, Daddy? No, it's us. It means He sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts to cause us to cry to the Father. Now go back over to Romans 8. Y'all know any little kid gets in trouble, and immediately what are they going to cry out? Dad. Dad or Mom. Mm -hmm. They can't help it, can they? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter seeing them be outside and see some special bug, and here she comes running. Ah, you know, <laughs> because you can't help it. But he, he clears this up for us in Romans 8. And if y'all remember, this was one of the fruits of the Spirit or one of the assurances of the Spirit. He says, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, how do you know if the Spirit's leading you? Well, you begin to see, your, you begin to produce in the fruit of the Spirit. I'll tell you, the first sign that the Spirit is leading you is when you believe on Jesus Christ in truth. You can't do that naturally. So he says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So it's the Holy Spirit coming in and doing what? causing us to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, y'all put this together with the groaning. It's nearly the same thing. It doesn't mean the groaning can't be a word. What it means is you cannot, you don't know what to ask for in the situation. You don't know what God's will is. You don't know what's right or wrong. And all you can really do is just groan about it. Just help me. Help. It's the same thing when you cry out, oh, Lord, help. Father, help. I've told y'all many times all I can get out really is just, Father, mercy. Just mercy. Just show us mercy. When I see things going on and, I mean, things happen around, Lexi just told me a story the other day about a lady and something she did with her child. And, it, it, I mean, I, look, I, I just, next time I probably just got down, all I could really say is, have, just have mercy on us, Lord. Yeah. Some lady wanted to go party and left her baby in the crib for 10 days. Oh. Starved to death. Oh. Can you imagine? And when you see something like that, it's like all that comes rushing through your mind for me is the effects of Adam's sin. That never would have happened if it weren't for Adam's sin and all our sins since. This is a corrupt, filthy place. I don't understand what, what's holding God back other than He knows best. But when you see something like that, and all, you don't even know, you don't know what to pray for the lay. You don't know what to do. 
You know, and lots of times we find ourselves in that situation. Now, Satan will come along and say, you're lost. You don't even know how to pray. If God was your father, you'd know his will. You'd know what to ask. No. In fact, you can tell Satan just the opposite. Not only do I not know what to pray, and I don't, and it doesn't cause me to think I'm lost. Get away from me because all I can do is come closer and holler, Dad, help. Father, help. And when you're drawn to God that way, it is an assurance of salvation. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, so the Holy Spirit finds us in trouble. He comes alongside. He takes up the load. He helps us to pray. He doesn't pray for us. He helps us like an attorney, like we said before, like an advocate. Okay? And Christ sits at the right hand, and He advocates with us with the Father, doesn't He? Look, verse 34 tells us that, 834. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, y'all look at this. I find this so comforting. Here I am on, on here, and I've got the Holy Spirit interceding for me opening my heart to understand something about God's will, to see truth from His Word, little at a time, but I've got the Holy Spirit involved helping me in all my infirmity. But at the same time, I know that if I, from the Holy Spirit, I've got the one that sent the Holy Spirit, don't I? The Father. But at the same time, I'm told that it's also the Son that sent the Spirit and that the Son intercedes with the Father and the Father has the Spirit prompt according to His will. So look who's involved in prayer. The whole Godhead. Yes. That's the, the, Trinity. Yeah, the Trinity. And you and I tend to forget sometimes. We tend to be taught when we pray to, to focus in, I think, sometimes too much on the Father. And I don't mean you can pray to the Father too much, but we've got to acknowledge the work of the Son and the Spirit. Take away any of them and what do you have? Nothing. Hey, y'all know when I was in the Navy, they taught us this triangle about fire. To have fire, what you got to have? Remember that, Tony? You got to have a source, oxygen, and a spark. Take away one of them, and guess what? You ain't going to have no fire. That's how you know the Big Bang's baloney. How could there have been a Big Bang if there was no spark? How could there, you see, I mean, they, they, the whole thing's crazy. They say all, oh, everything was condensed down in one dense thing, right? Okay, you had material, where's the oxygen? You tell me oxygen came from the explosion. Ain't that what they say? All the elements were created from the explosion? How? <laughs> it's crazy. All they've done is they've come up with a theory where they can put something in the place of God to explain the work of God because they know something caused it. So they've come up with a big bang, and really it's just like a false god to them. The big bang, if you want to watch the TV show, watch it, but don't believe that the big bang is real. Big bang's not real. It's foolishness. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. We talked about the lawyer. Y'all go to Philippians 2. Hey, Margaret used to say, you remember what she'd say how they, when she was little, they remembered Margaret and Gulf Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Yeah. Gulf Electric Power Company. That's what she used to say. <laughs> okay. In Philippians 2, verse 12, watch what Paul tells these people. Wherefore, my beloved, so he's talking to saved people, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, he said, I know you're obedient, not just when I'm around, he said, but now, much more. In other words, put forth more effort now. In my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this old English is confusing. It's not saying work for your salvation. That would go against the entire doctrine of the Bible, wouldn't it? It's saying, let that work out of you, which is currently working in you. Well, what's working in the saved person? Next verse. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now, people have gone too far with this and said, well, if God wills and God does and you don't do anything, just sit back and wait. Well, what did verse 12 say? Work. work. 
Folks, there's nothing in the Christian life about sit back and be lazy. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is not a one-sided thing. Remember what the whole issue is here. It's not the Holy Spirit comes along and takes the load out of our hand. The Holy Spirit comes along and picks the load up. He, I know this is going to be any, any example we use always falls short somewhere because it, it will. But I remember in weightlifting, right? You've got a weight you're trying to lift or you want to do so many reps with it. And you get to the last one. And if you're going to grow, honestly, what you need to do is you've got to stress your muscle more than you have before, either more weight or more reps. So you do a forced rep. What do you need to do a forced rep? A spotter. What does a spotter do? Yeah. yeah, you you bench pressing for instance, right? You, you get it up, you get to that last, when you start up with it, you get about right there, and it starts to go the other way. You push with all your might, and then the spotter does what? Yeah. Takes enough to keep you working and let you work right on up with it. Anti-gravity. Yeah, anti-gravity. There you go. <laughs> but I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is our spotter. But what I'm saying is He doesn't remove all uh, responsibility from us. We're told to pray. The Holy Spirit comes along and prompts us and keeps us praying. Even when everything in that situation tells me I don't know what to pray for, something still causes me to go to my knees and groan. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, let's see. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, put in the notes this question. Does God hear this groaning? Of course he does. Okay, go back to Romans 8 and notice how he put it again. In Romans 8 again he says, 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now watch how Paul answers this. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. He could have just said, God knows the mind of the Spirit, but he didn't. Instead he referred to God as he that searcheth the hearts. Why y'all think he put it that way? Because you know he knows what the groaning means. He knows. You'd have, there's no doubt when you pray. It, one of the things that really helped me, and I'm not saying I'm good at prayer. It's hard. Real prayer, it's really hard. If you've never struggled to pray, you might not have ever really tried to pray. Because when you get down to pray, one of the things you know is there's a barrier there because of our weakness. Distraction, just we can't see. Y'all know how we are. Sleepy. Sleepy, it could be lots of things. But one of the things you can, you can count on and when you get down to pray is know this. Okay, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I'm not playing a joke. I'm not putting on an act. I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus died to pay for my sins, and I believe He rose again. Therefore, I know that God hears my prayers, not because I'm good, not because I've been special this week, because my Savior has opened the way. So what I'm doing right now, I know God hears it. You think that way and you go through that in your prayer life and watch your prayers will improve. You know God's going to hear it. Not to mention He already knows the heart, doesn't He? Why does He want to hear it anyway? He can read our mind. He can read your mind, so why pray? Because God commanded us to. It's a means, but I'm going to give you all one more example I heard of. It's a fruit of the Spirit, right? It is a fruit of the Spirit, yes. What it, what it really comes down to, the best example I've ever heard is uh, I heard Donald Barnhouse talk one time about his kids going off to college, his oldest son. And this was during the Depression. He was a great old preacher from Philadelphia. And um, he said when his oldest son went off to college, he gave him, I don't know, some cash, right? Enough for a week. He was leaving to go to college. He said, now, he didn't give him enough for four years. Number one, he said, I didn't have enough for four years. Number two is, what idiot would give a teenager the money for four, right? But he said, that factored into it. He said, but that's not the real reason. He said, I told him, every Sunday you write me a letter, and at the top right corner of the letter you tell me how much you've got in pocket, how much cash you have on hand, right? He said, and we'll do it week by week. Now, he said he did it mainly for this reason. He wanted a letter every week. Mm -hmm. See? Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Brotherly love, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you see what he's doing? 
He wanted to hear from his child. He wanted his child. Not only that, but what's his child going to be? Grateful and thankful and appreciative and dependent. That's what God... Yes. God wants us as His children to come to Him. God wants us to appreciate Him. And God, folks, wants us to be grateful. Yes. Remember that in Romans 1, the main thing He's going to charge the, the lost with, when they are condemned and tossed into hell, whether they ever knew anything about the gospel doesn't matter. He said they knew there was a Creator. And He said, you weren't thankful, neither did you glorify me. Mm. Y'all know ingratitude is something that bothers everybody, doesn't it? He, I try and teach Sienna this. Gabriel ain't old enough yet, but I try and teach Sienna. Uh, you know, we have a that again, or I don't want to eat this, or I need that. What do you say? Hey, you'd be glad you got something, right? That's right. Right? Or, you know, I could do this. Hey, be appreciative. And I'm thankful that Sienna is like that. He, we're building them a tree house, and they're both really professional greasers. She's taught the three-year-old to say, thank you for working on that roof, and thank you for, you know. But y'all know, is there anything worse? I remember my granny going to Kroger's one time and coming back from Kroger's, and she had got, um, you know, just whatever she needed. She, my granny had no money. She struggled. But she come back, and I remember I was about 13, and I threw a hissy fit because she didn't get any pudding pops. Right? Mm -hmm. And my granny told me, sit down. And so I sat down at her kitchen table. She said, look in that bag. And I looked in the bag. Y'all know what was in the bag? Pudding nope. <laughs> Milk, eggs, bread, lunch need? meat. What you need. She said, I got what we needed. You be thankful for it. I could have got nothing. Yeah. Right? Now, if my mom had told me that, I'd have went right on complaining. But when my granny told you, she told you like this. And that was the end of it. He, me and Gina were having a fight one time. I, we didn't care much about my mom. Fight, it wasn't going to be anything. We were, got into it, and we wound up throwing frozen stuff out of the freezer at each other. And we were throwing it, and all of a sudden that door swung open. And my granny said, enough. Clean it up, and I don't want your mom to even know it happened. And boy, we went to clean it up immediately. He, but... Think of people that know by nature there's a creator. Yeah. Okay? You ask someone if they're, you know, say in our country, do you believe in God? And most people 30 and older will say yes. Well, the next question would be, well, then why don't you worship him? You don't really believe if you're not worshiping him. What you're basically saying is, I know there is a God who granted me life, but I don't appreciate it enough to. Now, don't they deserve to go to hell? I certainly did. I do now. The only reason I'm not is because God opened my heart and eyes that I could see what I am and turn and scream for help. I mean, y'all think about it. If Jesus Christ had not given his life for us, every one of us would go right to hell and God at the judgment seat would be able to say this, I put it in you to know there's a God and I gave you creation. You know there's a creator. Now you might grow up and deny it, but you know every atheist started believing in God. God put it in them. You get a little bitty kid, you do not have to teach them about God, it's in them. Anybody with common sense looks around and knows, hey, this didn't just all happen. But you send them off to public school and what happens? They start training that out of them. I heard uh, Vadi Bachman say one time, he's a, he's a really good preacher, but he said, we send our kids to Caesar for education and then we act surprised when they act like Romans. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> to find out if someone's an atheist, my test is to put them about 60,000 feet up in the airplane and let it nose die. Yeah. And the first thing they're going to do is God help me. They will. It'll come right back out. Yes. That's why the old saying, there's no atheist in foxholes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, I've told you all the story before about R.C. Sproul got called, got invited to Harvard to debate the Atheist Club. Any of y'all ever heard him tear that story? You ever heard that one, Lee? Uh I'm not sure I heard that one. It's a good one. They had an atheist club, and they invited him to debate because, of course, they're Harvard, and they're going to, and he accepted. He went up there, and they had their debate back and forth, and they're not going to, he's, the man had a degree in philosophy, and he's the greatest debater in the last hundred years. But anyway, he not only proved his point, but he told them, he said, your problem is not that you don't know if there's a God. 
He said, your problem is deep down you know there's a God and you hate that there's a God. He, they had to, security had to get him out of there. That's yeah, but it's that's the truth. the truth. It is the truth. Because Romans 1 said, God put it in us. Yes. So if you don't worship God, if you do believe that, and you do try to worship God, then God's going to send you more light. Mm -hmm. And if you obey that, you're going to be going on to hear the gospel. This is how God works. But if God sends you that original light, and you ignore that light, He don't need to send you anymore. That's rebellion. It's rebellion. And that's what sin is. It's rebellion against our Creator. Okay? That's what we're guilty of by nature. <clears throat> Alright, so um, I tell you what, I'm not going to go any further in our notes other than to say this. God searches the hearts, and what does God know about our heart? Our natural heart, corrupt. it is corrupt. corrupt. Okay? I'm going to quote Jeremiah 17 for you. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The word that's translated there in other verses is incurable. The human heart by nature is incurable. Well, if your heart is incurable, what do you need? You need a new heart. Transplant. You need a heart transplant. And what did God promise us under the new covenant? Amen. A new heart. Amen. That's what we need. And he said, when I give you this new heart, and it's not an actual physical heart, he's talking about opening our mind so that the truth can get into our soul. And he said, when I give you this new heart, the first thing that you're ever going to do, the very first act of obedience of a saved person, someone that has been regenerated, their first act of faith is their first work. The first thing you do after God regenerates you is believe. Yes. Honestly believe. And so God said, I'm going to take that new heart and then I'll start writing on that heart. And what did He say He could write on that heart? He could write the same thing that was written on those stones. Only difference is write them on those stones and I rebel and say, I refuse. Write it on that heart and what happens? You want to do it. You want to serve Him. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between fear and love, and this is how the whole new covenant works. And what makes us ever begin to have any love towards the Lord? Because He shows us first what Jesus Christ did for us. And if it doesn't move you that the Son of God suffered and died for your sins on that cross, something's wrong. Yes. It begins to move us. And we begin to see the sacrifice He made. What kind of love is more uh, strong or more uh, powerful than sacrificial love? Y'all know what that's like, don't you? Yes. Sacrificial love is serious love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. he, I had a friend one time that had, he always, he was married, but he always had at least one girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Lots of times he had three or four. He was telling me one time that he loved both of them. And I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. I said, you don't love either one of them. If you loved either one of them, you couldn't have the other one. It's impossible. Well, what we want to believe today in our country is that we can profess to be Christians and love the world. What did Jesus say? Yeah. You can't serve God and mammon. Now, I don't mean we don't work and make money and do things and all we do, but what is first in the life of a Christian? Christ. Folks, we've got to believe on and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our King. You can profess that someone is your King, but if you ignore all their laws, then what's that make you? A rebel. A rebel. And what happens to rebels? You know what the Bible says? The sin of rebellion is the same as witchcraft. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, you want to be guilty of witchcraft? Mm -hmm. Rebel against God. <laughs> That's pretty strong language, isn't it? <laughs> Huh? Uh, let me think. Where's that at, Lee? First Samuel. First Samuel, yep. Yeah. First Samuel. Yeah, with Saul. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, y'all remember King Saul? Yeah. He sent him off to conquer some people, and he said, but don't take the animals, kill it, everything, and leave it there. And he comes back, and he's got all the good herd. And Samuel comes back to Saul, and he says, Saul said, well, I did just exactly what you said. And Samuel said, then what's this mooing and bad I hear? That's what he told him. And he said, well, the people wanted to sacrifice. We kept those a sacrifice to God. And Samuel said to him, essentially, what's more important to God, sacrifice or obedience? Mm -hmm. 
And he said, your rebellion is as witchcraft. And that day, he said, the kingdom has been taken from you and given to another. And Saul's life went downhill from there. One of the last things he did to prove his rebellion was like witchcraft is he couldn't pray to God. He wouldn't hear him. He went to a witch, didn't he? He sought help from a witch. Remember that? Yeah, it was a big mistake. And that man professed to be saved, and he sure looked at it first, didn't he? Okay, do we have any questions then about the work of the Spirit there in the, in the prayer life? Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that He helps us with our prayers? Yes. Folks, if it was on me, I couldn't do it. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then. Our Father, we thank You for these things that we've seen tonight. And we thank You for the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Lord, we ask You to give us more of the Spirit, to pour Him out in new ways upon us, to enlighten our eyes that we might know You better, that we might love You more and serve You. Lord, we pray that You build us up and strengthen us, not for our own uh, profit or for our own popularity, but that we might be useful in Your kingdom and that others might see Christ in us and be drawn to our Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.